much. I'm extraordinarily excited to be here today in New Zealand. This presentation really is as much for you as, in the, as about you because you're our customer. So mostly I want to thank you and stuff for being that. What we hope to do is create authentic experiences that rock. We're in over 63 countries. We have 202 venues, of which 156 of them are restaurants. We have 22 hotels. We have 11 casinos, four live music venues. We have 77,000 pieces of memorabilia, um, out of which um, we have the largest guitar collection in the world. Um, with 26,000 music events that we do, we have a lot of content. We generate a lot of content. So when we talk about kind of some of the things that we have as arsenal things that we play with, um, those are kind of some of the pieces and stuff that we get to use from a marketing standpoint. So what we're finding, and I'm sure that you're finding it too, is our customer is changing. We're changing individually, right? As customers, we're really on demand. And what folks want is the ability to do all of these things. We just heard it before in some previous presentations. And so really kind of what does that mean for us of always being on demand? It means as marketers, we have to be in our messages be able to be consumed in the places that these customers want to. So obviously with Airbnb, like Uber, right? Everything we want it now, even the dating services that we talked about. So for us, we kind of care about who is our customer? And so as Hard Rock, we have 14 and a half million fans on, across all of the social media channels. We manage over 1,300 accounts. Okay, so when we talk about reputation management, when you look at what we're listening to and engaging in conversations, we're in a lot of different places. So we really care about what are the trends and where are people at and what are they doing in that, that customer engagement of where they're at with those proliferation of devices and finding things out. We find that really, and actually 84% of people post about pets. In 2014, cats was the number one trend, and it's still in 2015 the number one trend. So unfortunately, we have, we have these little bears that are little stuffed bears, and they have these little hoodies on them that they're Hard Rock hoodies. And then, so we posted this picture of the cat in the Hard Rock hoodie. So then everybody started putting their animals in these little hoodies. And then they started stuffing dogs in them too. And then we're like, oh my God, we gotta stop because it's really kind of turning into animal abuse, you know? So it's like, this is not good. 78% actually look about their careers, right? Job searching, LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. 78% um, post on travel. So if you're like for us in the hospitality industry, this is really important engagement places that we can participate in those kinds of conversations to get into something and start actually talking kind of about hard rock. So even if you're in tangential things to these conversations in your particular industry or your product and service, this actually really kind of matters. 65% post about parenting skills. 55% actually look at real estate. So not so much of like homes for sale, right? So, um, and again, just looking for pictures and stuff of posting on certain areas. But did you know that actually 56% of all social media is happening in channels that are not the traditional channels? And so by meaning dark is you can't be tracked, you can't be traced, and you can't have your information sold to us as marketers to market to you better. So we're not even being, as marketers, invited to these conversations. If you don't know what these channels are, you're probably actually already in them. Instant messaging, right? So instant messaging, these private conversations we have with our friends, our family members, right? They're being tracked mainly by your mobile carriers, but they're not being sold to us. And those individual conversations aren't for demographic purposes being sold to us for us knowing what's going on. Okay, chatting, right? The chatting apps, the rise of the chatting apps of, of making this happen. Now again, this is mostly what we're seeing in the demographic standpoint, a much younger that's starting to swing into a little older, right? So again, the WhatsApp, the Snapchats of the world. So all of that information, which we're told, in a, and what I teach people like at the Hard Rock, because we kind of, around the world, we have marketing organizations everywhere, and stuff toing of these Snap, or the chatting apps, right, is most people don't realize that they think that, like in the Snapchat world, where you can take the image and you can time bomb it, right? So five seconds, five minutes, five days, right? I can send you a message and it'll go away, right? The rise of the sexting. WhatsApp, right? Not bad for 438 million people. Line from Japan, 170 million people. The cacao out of Korea, 
right? 100 million. Those are in users. So who, anybody, has the time, the energy, and the effort, and the resources to now have one-on-one -on -one engagement, private conversations with all these people, right? And you have no tools to be able to see if any of these conversations are actually working for you or turning into real dollars and stuff for you. And the biggest one, the Snapchat one, right? So now we're up to four billion a day, video views. So it's crazy the amount of stuff in that's coming on here. So things that we kind of got to worry about is how do we attack these channels, right? What are we going to end up doing? So in a lot of cases, do you feel some like, like we do? This is about being the digital native of, of millennials versus the inhabitants, for us that are older than that, of keeping up with the pace of all of this technology because it's coming at an astronomical speed. Innovation is coming at such a warp pace that sometimes it's really hard to keep up no matter who you are, right? So in a digital strategy, and this is how I look at it, these are my three planks and stuff of how I approach how do we have a digital strategy that fits across the world, across all of our different business units and all of our different markets that might make sense to make the Hard Rock brand be consistent and, and, the, and the consumers not be confused kind of across the world. The first thing is, is we want to drive those online interactions, right? It's those engagement pieces. We want to have increase, actually, what we're doing there, convert them to where we're actually making some money from it. And in the end, we want to grow our customers' loyalty. So those are the three things that I focus on. So the first thing from a driving online interactions, right, is those social media and platforms. We've heard about it a number of times. It's about building trust. It's about establishing that relationship, right? And ultimately, it's about loyalty because we know what happens with loyalty people. And we actually want to enable those promotions. We have campaigns, we're marketers, right? We want to get the message across all of those things consistently across those 1,300 plus accounts. And then ultimately, we want to cross promote all of our locations around the world so it's exciting for you to come to Hard Rock no matter where you're at or where you visit. But in 2015, you we know the world kind of changed in social media. It's not so social anymore. It's about paid media, right? And it's a broadcast medium. We heard in traditional marketing, right, it was about advertising on radio and TV. Well, it's the same way now in social media. The people of things that you're seeing in your news feeds are the ones that are paying the highest price to get their message in front of folks, right? So the world kind of changed for us. So to quote Taylor Swift, sort of, right? We can at least be smart in where we pay to play. Okay. <laughs> Nobody hates these people more than me. And the reason why I do is because I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated on behalf of everybody that when we deal with them is it's constantly changing. There's always something else that's going on. You get one strategy down and the algorithm in the news feed changed completely. You're constantly playing catch up. They don't tell you what to do. We, we're a managed account at Facebook and our Facebook manager doesn't even tell us when this stuff changes, right? However, with a billion daily users, right? We've heard it. We've got to play here whether we like it or not. 35% of all social sharing, all of it, anywhere on the world, on the internet, happens in Facebook, right? So when we pay to play here, we can do it very, very cheaply. We can target very, very specifically. And it's very, very low hanging fruit for you to actually go into this, put a little bit of money behind it, and get your message seen to basically anybody you want in the world to target to. Twitter. Yeah. Used to, they used to be like my best buddies and stuff. I loved promoting with them. They've got still 284 million daily users, right? 500 million tweets a day. But our problem is, is when it used to be about having the most number of followers and, and being able to get your tweets out there, the thing you're finding out is that one in every 10 account is fake. How do you know which ones are the fake ones and which ones are the real ones? that are here because of the click farms. So now when you're talking about influencer marketing, right, and you're looking at, wow, they've got 2 million followers, right, or 40 million followers. And I'm going to give you an, um, a Rihanna example in just a second. You're like, well, you know what? I need them to be real fans because I really want them to react to my messages because ultimately I really kind of want them to come into a hard rock 
and we want to give them a, an authentic experience that rocks. What's terrible about the click farms is you've got people with big advertising budgets that want to make something kind of go viral, right? So I'm going to pay some of these companies now that are taking millennials that say, wow, for every 10 videos you watch, I'm going to give you a dollar. For every 25 tweets, I'll give you another dollar. So a lot of kids are out there creating a lot of different accounts, as many as they can, right? Because they're going to action things that are happening in social media, and they're going to get paid for it. They're going to get paid for it from a marketing budget, like, and I'm not going to, anybody that's a big player with a big budget that says, here's $300,000, I want 3 million video views. And then when you get all of these other kind of agency kind of accounts that troll and watch which videos and stuff are getting seen so they, they can see trending videos and we can get on top of it, it's because these clip farms are making it happen. So then it's like, well, is it really a viral video? Well, at some point there's a tipping point that happens, but it's usually being caused kind of by this. So one of the things that kind of gave me a, a feeling better about it is we did some work with Rihanna. Lovely. She, she's great to work with, actually. She has like 40 million people on Twitter. So of that 40 million people, you know, when she posts something, only about 17,000 of them do something. You're like, wow, having 17,000 retweets or reposts and stuff is a lot out of 40 million, right? Doesn't seem so much, right? So then I started feeling better by some of our tweets or retweets and the scale of it and stuff just because you have no idea who the real fans are or not. Instagram. So part of our strategy this year was to stay in Instagram because it really still had 300 million daily users, right? 41% of them are in the, the magic millennial group, right? 18 to 24, right? And they've got 20 billion photos. We get close to 46,000 photos a month hashtagged in Instagram alone that we have to curate. Okay, so we, we do a lot of curation of, of content and stuff that ends up having with it. So the only thing is, is that now that Instagram they're bought by Facebook, once again, they've got to make their money back, are starting to do the advertising model. So where it was a very good, interesting content play for us is now turning out to be, we're going to have to throw money at that too, so we're going to start budgeting for Instagram in 2016. And again, what's kind of interesting about that from a millennial play is that people are accessing it by three different devices. So for that 300%, and we think about it, we all probably have a laptop, we all probably have a tablet, we all probably have a smartphone and stuff. So now I'm going to access my account on three different devices. Oh, I love Pinterest. I love Pinterest. It's like rugby for girls. Yeah. Billion boards created. OK, so how many of you are in Pinterest? Ladies, yes, it's awesome, right? 45 million users because 85% of us are women, right? So we're pinning. So for the guys who may not be in Pinterest, this is how we're doing visual boards, right? Our ideas, things we want to eat, where we want to go, stuff we want to wear, what we might end up buying and stuff with it. And 93% have shopped online in the last six months. So if you're selling products and services online, this is a great place to be. Because if they're going to interact with you, then it's probably going to be here. The cool thing about Pinterest, which is very different from the social media stuff, if you didn't know, Right? It's about interest. It's an interest graph. It's not a social graph. This is not about followers. This is not about how many friends you have. This is about people who share a common interest. Right? So you're going to find folks that actually might like something and stuff that's behind it. One in five who have purchased something right, on a site actually do twice as much. So if you're going to do spending, and we're talking about spending in Pinterest and stuff on, those, on, on the little buy it pin buttons, you're actually going to be twice as more effective than in Facebook. Actually, they spend twice as much, and they, um, they do it two times more likely. All right, so we talked about challenging, right? Here's what's so cool about Pinterest. As marketers, and we all are, we are all looking for now finding the right demographics, profiling, segmenting, being kind of where people are. This is my board, OK? And, and I actually don't have it public, but you're going to see kind of some fun things and stuff here. What you're going to see is if you look at anyone's boards, anyone's, you can see exactly what's going on in their head, right? So when we just heard about, like, the best thing you can have is your idea in someone else's head, go look at what's inside other people's heads, and that's in Pinterest. I just give you that as an idea of looking at somebody and looking into their mind and stuff, and as marketers, 
getting good at finding patterns, right, of what people like and stuff, and then finding a niche, right, that might end up making our, our sales and stuff better. And we can't be everywhere. We just talked about four, right, of a social networking. This is a fraction, really, of kind of what's out there. And when we actually heard a little bit earlier today, it was like, how many of you had to go, you got to be where your customers are, right? Everywhere. We can't be everywhere our customers are. None of us have the money, the time, the resources, or the energy to be everywhere, right? So in the end, just be amazing where you can, OK? That's really what it comes down to. All right, so we do all of that work online. And at the end of the day, I still get our CEO, my boss, the CMO, come up to me and say, Hey, all that stuff you're doing in social media, how much money has that made us, right? Same thing, right? We got to get them in, and I got to have proof and stuff of how we're driving all of that conversation inside. So we're really trying to manage that content, right, with a single tool, well, some tools and stuff that we have. We really want um, approved creative. So with 200 locations that have 200 different sales and marketing teams and groups and stuff out there, and they're all creating their own communities and their environments and their markets and stuff around the world, we still kind of want a consistent message. We still want consistent look, consistent kind of content and stuff so that people really kind of aren't confused about the Hard Rock brand. We always offer, again, and my team and stuff, some supplemental marketing stuff, some pay-per-click, some search engine optimization um, and what we have. So there might be some in-house things that you might be able to do too. And at the end of the day, we have to give very highly transparent reporting. So again, when all of our partners, a lot of cases, we're a franchise model around the world, the stuff that we do on behalf of the brand that goes out there needs to be measured, right? So here's a little Google lesson, okay? All right, I love doing this one because there's an easy way to game the engines, okay? I'm a tech girl, right? With all my years and stuff at Microsoft. Um, and again, I actually get into it. I told you I was a digital geek anyway. So without kind of going into teaching you about like different animals and stuff, right? What you care about is this is some of the digital basics and the things that we worry about really kind of consistently across our brand and the folks that work with it, okay? So, Every tech company always kind of, they name their little parts of their projects and stuff. Microsoft, we named them cities. Windows had city names every time a new version and stuff came out. Google, in the search engine algorithm, actually names them after certain pets, or not pets, animals and stuff that's there. So there's over 200 different things that you have to worry about to game the Google algorithm. I'm not going through all 200 of them today. I'm going through the top ones that really kind of make sense for you guys. Right? So what we care about is having that fresh quality content. What works for us is, is we have over 200 different websites underneath the hardrock.com. So anytime any independent website that's actually housed up underneath it, it creates fresh content. Everybody wins, right? Because the algorithm cares about having fresh content. That's why you typically have blogs and stuff on your website is because it's generating fresh content. So you want to do that. If you're not updating it, and it becomes stale, you get penalized for it, right? That's called the panda penalty. So you really kind of care about having something that generates, obviously, more content. We got a lot of content, so it's not usually a hard thing and stuff for us to get some quality up there. We also care about links, right? Good links, not bad spammy links and stuff that are there too. Good links are obviously linking to your Facebook page or to your Twitter stuff, right? And those are highly desired and they got high ranking and stuff actually over on the Google one. When you link to good websites that have high rankings, good things happen to you. When you link to crap websites, bad things happen to you. And that's the penguin penalty, okay? Then there's pigeon. Oh, we're getting into the birds now, okay? Hyperlocal, everybody wants to be hyperlocal. So we have tons of review sites that come up there, yellow page sites that are there, things that want to be found, and they want because those sites need fresh content. So they scrape off your site and they dump it someplace else. So our problem is, is we need to make sure our sites are constantly updated because we have no idea who's scraping them, where they're getting thrown, and really, we just want to make sure that we're accurate pretty much as much as possible. So we kind of want to make sure everything is kind of right on our sites and stuff too. And lastly, the keywords and stuff really kind of had gone away. So it's super important that your content on your pages actually are like how people search. And I always use this example. What did Miley Cyrus wear on the VMAs, right? That's how people search anymore. They don't search for keywords going, 
Miley and Cyrus and search and stuff. So you kind of want to make sure that all of your content and stuff has the way people search now. Way different, okay? Easy, easy, easy stuff. It's free, stuff you can do when you're back in the office. Doesn't require an agency. There's no money being thrown at it. Simple, do the basics. All right, I love this one too. Okay, because this is how we do paid media, right? So whether there is a DMP or you know, the exchanges that are here or the DSPs, these are all the different areas and channels and things that we have to do to get something out there in the digital space to make things kind of fun and, and exciting and, and go and happen. So I just tell people, like, it's not meant for you guys to do it, is that there's people out there that do make a living in any one of these categories. And all those little spots in between are some of the people and stuff that have, obviously, the expertise in that area. I know enough about this stuff to be dangerous in any given area, but I don't know it all. I don't have the time to know it all. And really, it, it is a career in most cases and stuff as well. So you just have to kind of be on top of it of understanding all the tracking and stuff that gets together. The things that I care about is we actually kind of have to plan ahead of time to really leverage the heck out of this to make sure stuff actually happens and we can track it at the end of the day. So this should seem obvious. Funny is, in our case, a lot of it is the obvious we don't tend to do, right? So anyway, have some sort of a need. We develop some sort of promotion. We figure out how we're going to do it and what channel it's going to end up being in. We actually do establish some level of some KPIs. We do end up having to sign off on things because sometimes we just do it. And if you don't need the sign offs, great. And at the end, we end up using an agency out of it. We used to do a lot of it ourselves. A lot of it we still do ourselves. The problem is, is that, again, those niches are so now important that if we actually get ahead of it, we can put in all the right tagging, we can have all the right reporting, and I really can close the loop and have an ROI and stuff of everything that kind of happens out of it. All right? If you don't use it, we use some other tools as well. We have a kind of Adobe Analytics. If you have it, the least you can do is Google Analytics. It's amazing how many people have websites and then don't use their analytics to do something with it. We've heard all about data. We've heard about the you know, measurement and all of the data-driven stuff that's here. Use it, right? Because it tells you a lot of things about your audience and stuff to get your message out there. And if you can, find the right ROI tools. Heard a lot about that and stuff today. I told you, we have 46,000 photos and stuff a month. We use a tool, we actually use a bunch of different tools and stuff to, to manage our reputation and stuff around the world. One of our photo ones that we use is a company called Olapic. We're actually gonna switch to a company called Spread Fast. I heard Sprout Social mentioned a few other places. Here's what's terrible about some of these folks, right? And it's terrible, it's not their fault, is that the Facebook and the Twitters of the world don't open up their APIs to get all of the information that's coming through. So come to find out that spread fast, only two companies actually get the entire fire hose from Facebook and Twitter. And that means everything. So you're only seeing about 30% 30, 30 if you're using tools that aren't from these two companies about what's actually happening and talking about your brands in those spaces. So we care to get the entire fire hose, right, of where we can. And so we're actually kind of switching with it. But find the right tools and stuff so that you can curate it and that you can follow it and you've got the analytics and stuff to make sure that it's working and stuff for you. So I just wanted to have those kind of tools. So my message is do the digital basics. It's cheap, right? It's free. And lastly, growing customer loyalty, right? So if you don't have a loyalty program, I would highly encourage you to have something that's tiny, it's small, something that rewards your best customer. Because what we found is we created Hard Rock Rewards, and this isn't a, a sell job on, on Hard Rock Rewards, but it's two and a half million people now in, in a couple of years. And what we found kind of with the data is, is that people do want to be recognized, and most of your fans do want us to know that you've been to 10 Hard Rocks around the world, or 100 Hard Rocks, or that we know that you like that, that particular hamburger, or you like fluffy pillows and stuff when you go stay at a hotel. And this program has allowed us to do it, but the most important thing that most people want when they come to Hard Rock it's a kick-ass experience, right? So what we can do is invite them to those kick-ass experiences. We get 26,000 music events that happen all the time. We got places to invite you to come in and have an experience and stuff with it. So really, even within your own industries, if you're not like a heart rock that has it, your members do want something that's unique and stuff from you. That's the changing kind of world that we're in. 
So if you can create some level of memorable experiences or invite them, again, that's the content that you can show them behind the scenes, they do like it. And when you can get them into that programmatic engagement where they're in a constant communication with you or emails or newsletters or whatever, you do find that they come back more often and they do spend more when they do come and stuff. So it works for us. Um, that's why people invest in loyalty programs. It is worth the investment and stuff for you to go do it. So if you can, create experiences, right? They will love you for it. So if you can, what you might want to see is how do we pull all this stuff together a little bit, right? So we have, we're going into October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month in the United States and stuff. We actually have been doing this for 16 years. We have the hashtag Pinktober, actually Pinktober's trademark is owned by us. And we try to make it kind of consistent and create content and stuff around it. So we create all of our profile pictures, we create videos, everything that we kind of can do that looks kind of consistent out there. And as digital marketers, we actually create a digital marketing guide. And we tell people what to post, how to post it, what to localize, and we send that out for every single campaign that we do. We give it to all of the musician and artists and stuff that we work with too, going, hey, Rihanna, tweet this, right? Here's all the things that we want you to do. Use these hashtags so then we can track it and stuff and see how effective every single channel is, right? And then we push it across all of the websites. So what's ended up happening is location has now become the new cookie, right? We check in. We have location services wherever we go. I check in now. People around the world can tell where I am in Auckland, New Zealand. I've now become the cookie for wherever I go. So the challenge is, is us as marketers is now to find the right messaging, the right content, the right context to get our message to the person wherever they're at in the world where they have dropped their cookie, right, by checking in. So those are the things kind of that I'm looking at. But here's one, near field communication. So this was McDonald's did something with a company, a location-based um, service company, where they created their table, and instead of the happy meal, they had the happy table. So they put the little stickers underneath it, and actually they were stickers, they weren't RFID. They actually had a near-field communication on it where the kids would run their phone across the top of the table, and as they hit the sensors of the near-field communication, it did different things inside the app, and they got to play a game. So those are very interesting things to me as a restaurant company of could I have near field communication on a table where I could wipe it across it and I could pop up a menu, right? Or I have memorabilia that's on the walls. Can I be close enough to something where it pops up and I can shoot you a video or I can show you something that's related to a piece, an artifact that might actually be on the wall? Could be very interesting and stuff with it. Now we actually checked with our Apple rep and they said it didn't work too well with the Apple devices, so I think that they've kind of yanked out some of the technology that's there. Might work on the Samsung ones, but anyway, this is stuff kind of to kind of look into, right? This is my most favorite. Oh my gosh, this is so smart. These are people who are smart people. All right, so this guy, I was at a different conference and stuff back earlier this year and I saw this stuff and I was just so amazed by it. So magnetic mapping, somebody has figured out the mathematical algorithm that buildings give a unique footprint and a, and a code to their location to the center of the Earth's core. I'm like, who thinks of these things? So the guy that invented this uses the compass on your phone, right, to magnetically map your buildings with it. And, and no matter where you're sat at, physically in your location to the core of the Earth, can pop you a message. It's crazy. Dad's some sort of physicist, and so I guess what physicist children do, right, is they come up with crazy things, right? So he did. So what's really fascinating and stuff to me is this is, if they ever watched the Tom Cruise movie Minority Report, this is bringing this stuff to life. It's crazy. So for us, we could take any one of our buildings, right, map its location signals that it's coming off based on his app, and then we can start creating content and an app basically that uses these different locations of where you're standing and pop you different messages. That's crazy. That'd be cool, right? So I told you I'd geek out on this stuff, right? All right, holographic lenses. So we just bypass virtual reality all together and we're going to holographic lenses. So this is coming out now with the new Xbox, right? Now you know I'm an ex-Microsoft person so kind of like this stuff. Anyway, what they're doing with the holographic lenses, this is so cool, is now, right, you put them on, 
you see your, you can kind of see behind it, but really it's giving you the world of your desktop on your eyes. So it's kind of Terminator-ish, right? You're gonna see all this stuff kind of pop up. But what's kind of cool about it is that the idea behind it is if you want the picture in your background, it's like, wow, I really want that palatial looking patio and the fountain, I'll make that over here. So I've got a fountain. So my little crappy apartment, maybe I've got one, right, that has nothing on the walls, I can, when I put on my glasses, put pictures up, right, that I found on the internet, right? Or, or maybe it's our pictures of our Eric Clapton guitars that might end up being there. You can virtually create what your world looks like through your lenses. You take it off, you're still in your crappy little apartment, right? But you put them back on, it's gonna look amazing, right? So then you get some for your friends when they come on over. Really interesting kind of experiences that we can create and stuff now with these lenses. Ah, servant robots. Wow, right? They're flipping pancakes. How long is it going to be before they're flipping burgers, right? Or they're cleaning rooms. And they're already doing that, right? We've got vacuums that do things now, too. So the things that we kind of probably have to worry about in the future isn't really somebody updating the code. It's hacking the, the robot, right? So what if they hack your robot? And in this case, it could be actually watching you sleep sharpening a knife, right? <laughs> so just some things and stuff, yeah, kind of like to think about. So really, you know, kind of wrapping it all up for you right now. You can't be everywhere, right? So just be amazing where you can be, right? So if you don't have a big budget, if you just did the basics, you'd probably be okay, right? And your customers really want to be recognized and they want to be loved. Right, so create that loyalty program. And really, you'll watch your big brand, your, your brand grow. So with that, I really want to thank you. You guys look amazing, okay? So that's it. Thanks.